The Dirty War Spanish, Guerra Sucia, is the name used by the military junta or civic military dictatorship of Argentina Spanish, Dictadura Civico Militar de Argentina for the period of state terrorism in Argentina from 1974 to 1983 as a part of Operation Condor, during which military and security forces and right-wing death squads in the form of the Argentine Anti-Communist Alliance AAA, or AAA, hunted down any political dissidents and anyone believed to be associated with socialism, left-wing Peronism or the Montaneros movement, about 30,000 people disappeared, many of whom were impossible to formally report due to the nature of state terrorism. The justification for the Dirty War was the armed actions of the Montaneros and the ERP. From 1969 to 1979, there were 239 kidnappings and 1,020 murders by the guerrillas. Therefore, the targets were students, militants, trade unionists, writers, journalists, artists and anyone suspected to be a left-wing activist, included Peronist guerrillas. The «disappeared» victims kidnapped, tortured and murdered whose bodies were disappeared by the military government included those thought to be politically or ideologically a threat to the military junta even vaguely, or contrary to the plan of neoliberal economic policies dictated by Operation Condor. They were killed in an attempt by the junta to silence the social and political opposition. Many of the members of the juntas are currently in prison for crimes against humanity and genocide. Topic overview. In the decades before the 1976 coup, the Argentinian military, supported by the Argentine establishment, opposed Juan Domingo Perón's populist government and attempted a coup in 1951 and two in 1955 before succeeding with the self-proclaimed Revolución Libertadora liberating revolution. After taking control, the armed forces proscribed Peronism, a decision that triggered the organization of Peronist resistance in workplaces and trade unions, as the working classes sought to protect the economic and social improvements obtained under Peron's rule. Soon after the coup, Peronist resistance began organizing in workplaces and trade unions as the working classes sought economic and social improvements. Over time, as democratic rule was partially restored, but promises of legalizing the expression and political liberties for Peronism were not respected, guerrilla groups began to operate in the 1960s, namely Uterunkos and the EGP People's Guerrilla Army. Both were small and quickly defeated. As Peron returned from exile in 1973, the Azaza massacre marked the end of the alliance between left and right-wing factions of Peronism. In 1974, Perón withdrew his support for the Montaneros shortly before his death. During the presidency of his widow Isabel, the far-right paramilitary death squad Argentine Anti-Communist Alliance AAA, or AAA, emerged. In 1975, Isabel signed a number of decrees empowering the military and the police to «annihilate» left-wing activists. In 1976, her government was overthrown as a part of Operation Condor by a military coup led by General Jorge Rafael Videla. The junta, calling itself the National Reorganization Process, organized and carried out strong repression of political dissidents or perceived as such through the government's military and security forces. They were responsible for the arrest, torture, killings and or forced disappearances of an estimated 30,000 people. The junta would dictate Argentina's future. With the help of Washington, the junta was aided with $50 million in military aid. Another group in the far right that was responsible for the death of many was, Alianza Anticomunista Argentina otherwise known as AAA. AAA was ruled under José López Riga, the Minister of Social Welfare who used AAA as a death squad regime. Both the junta and AAA targeted young professionals, high school and college students and trade union members. These groups of people became main targets because of their involvement in political organizations that exploited the work of the right-wing group. Assassination occurred domestically in Argentina via mass shootings and the throwing of live citizens from airplanes to death in the South Atlantic. Additionally, 12,000 prisoners, many of whom had not been convicted through legal processes, were detained in a network of 340 secret concentration camps located throughout Argentina. AAA partnered with the Army, Navy and the Air Force to terrorize the population. Navy captains such as Adolfo Salingo performed massive number of executions. These actions against victims called desaparecidos because they simply disappeared 
without explanation were confirmed via Salingo, who has publicly confessed his participation in the Dirty War, stating that the Argentinian military did worse things than the Nazis. In 1983, the National Commission on Disappeared People forced Salingo to testify where he described how prisoners were drugged, loaded onto military planes, and thrown, naked and semi-conscious, into the Atlantic Ocean. A vast majority of those who were killed left with no trace or record of their disappearance. The junta referred to their policy of suppressing opponents as the national reorganization process, Proceso de Reorganización Nacional. Argentine military and security forces also created paramilitary death squads operating behind fronts as supposedly independent units. Argentina coordinated actions with other South American dictatorship as in Operation Condor. Faced with increasing public opposition and severe economic problems, the military tried to regain popularity by occupying the disputed Falkland Islands. During the resulting Falklands War, the military government lost any remaining favor after its defeat by Britain, forcing it to step aside in disgrace and allow for free elections to be held in late 1983. Topic. Restoration of democracy and trial of the juntas The democratic government of Raúl Alfonsín was elected to office in 1983. Alfonsín organized the National Commission on the Disappearance of Persons Commission Nacional sobre la Desaparición de Personas, CONADEP to investigate crimes committed during the Dirty War, and heard testimony from hundreds of witnesses and began to develop cases against offenders. The commission organized a tribunal to conduct a transparent prosecution of offenders, holding the trial of the juntas in 1985. Among the nearly 300 people prosecuted, many of the leading officers were charged, convicted and sentenced for their crimes. The Argentinian armed forces opposed subjecting more of its personnel to the trials, threatening the civilian leadership with another coup. In 1986, the military forced the passage of the Ley de Punto Final full stop law in 1986, which put a line under previous actions and ended prosecutions for crimes committed by the national reorganization process. Fearing military uprisings, Argentina's first two presidents sentenced only the two top Dirty War former commanders. The Punto Final Law stated that military personnel involved in torture were doing their jobs. In 1994, President Carlos Menem praised the military in their fight against subversion. Topic. Repeal of laws In 2003, Congress repealed the pardon laws, and in 2005 the Argentine Supreme Court ruled they were unconstitutional. Under the presidency of Nestor Kirchner, the Argentine government reopened its investigations on crimes against humanity and genocide in 2006 and began the prosecution of military and security officers. Topic. Origin of the term The term Dirty War was used by the military junta, which claimed that a war, albeit with different methods, including the large scale application of torture and rape, was necessary to maintain social order and eradicate political subversives. This explanation has been questioned in court by human rights NGOs, as it suggests that a civil war was going on and implies justification for the killings. During the 1985 trial of the Juntas, public prosecutor Julio Strassera suggested that the term dirty war was a euphemism to try to conceal gang activities, as though they were legitimate military activities. Although the junta said its objective was to eradicate guerrilla activity because of its threat to the state, it conducted wide scale repression of the general population, it worked against all political opposition and those it considered on the left trade unionists, half of the victims, students, intellectuals including journalists and writers, rights activists and other civilians and their families. Many others went into exile to survive and many remain in exile today despite the return of democracy in 1983. During the trial of the Juntas, the prosecution established that the guerrillas were never substantial enough to pose a real threat to the state and could not be considered a belligerent as in a war. The guerrilla had not taken control of any part of the national territory, they had not obtained recognition of interior or anterior belligerency, they were not massively supported by any foreign power, and they lacked the population support. 
The program of extermination of dissidents was referred to as genocide by a court of law for the first time during the trial of Miguel Echecolitz, a former senior official of the Buenos Aires Provincial Police. Crimes committed during this time, genocide of civilian population and other crimes against humanity are not covered under the laws of war, in Bello, which shields enlisted personnel from prosecution for acts committed under orders given by a superior officer or the state. Estela de Carlotto, president of the Argentine human rights non-governmental organization Grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo states, That term is a way to minimize state terrorism and is a term born outside the country. It is a totally wrong concept, there was no war, dirty nor clean. <laughs> Return of Peronism Since former Army officer Juan Perón was ousted from the presidency by a coup in 1955 Revolución Libertadora, military hostility to Peronism and populist politics dominated Argentine politics. The 1963 Aramburu Decree prohibited the use of Perón's name and when General Lanis, who was part of the Argentine Revolution, called for elections in 1973, he authorized the return of political parties. However, Perón, who had been invited back from exile, was barred from seeking office. In May 1973, Peronist Héctor José Campora was elected as president, but everyone understood that Perón was the real power behind him. Peronism has been difficult to define according to traditional political classifications and different periods must be distinguished. A populist and nationalist movement, it has sometimes been accused of fascist tendencies as Perón's admiration for Benito Mussolini is often cited in support of that assertion. After World War II, Argentina became a popular country of exile for escaped Nazi war criminals who entered clandestinely via various ratlines. Following nearly two decades of weak civilian governments, economic decline and military interventionism, Perón returned from exile on 20 June in 1973, as the country was becoming engulfed in immense financial, social and political disorder. The months preceding his return were marked by important social movements as in the rest of South America and in particular of the Southern Cone before the military intervention of the 1970s, thus during Hector Campora's first months of government May to July 1973, approximately 600 social conflicts, strikes and factory occupations had taken place. Upon Perón's arrival at Buenos Aires Airport, snipers opened fire on the crowds of left-wing Perónist sympathizers. Known as the 1973 Azaza Massacre, this event marked the split between left-wing and right-wing factions of Peronism. Peron was re-elected in 1973, backed by a broad coalition that ranged from trade unionists in the center to fascists on the right including members of the neo-fascist Movimiento Nacionalista Tequara and socialists like the Montaneros led by Mario Fermanich on the left. Following the Azaza Massacre and Peron's denouncing of "...bearded immature idealists." Perón sided with the Peronist right, the trade unionist bureaucracy and radical civic union of Ricardo Balbin, Campora's unsuccessful rival at the May 1973 elections. Some leftist Peronist governors were deposed, among them Ricardo Obregón Cano, governor of Córdoba, who was ousted by a police coup in February 1974. According to historian Cerveto, the Peronist right thus stimulated the intervention of security forces to resolve internal conflicts of Peronism. <inaudible> Isabel Perón's government Perón died on 1 July 1974 and was replaced by his vice president and third wife, Isabel Perón, who ruled Argentina until overthrown in March 1976 by the military. The 1985 CONADEP Human Rights Commission counted 458 assassinations from 1973 to 1975 in its report Nunca Mas Never Again, 19 in 1973, 50 in 1974 and 359 in 1975, carried out by paramilitary groups, who acted mostly under the José López Rigas Triple A Death Squad According to Argen Press, at least 25 trade unionists were assassinated in 1974. However, the repression of the social movements had already started before the attempt on Irigoyen's life. On the 17th of July 1973, the CGT section in Salta was closed while the CGT, SMATA and Luz y Fuerza in Córdoba were victims of armed attacks. 
Augustine Tosco, Secretary General of Luz y Fuerza, successfully avoided arrest and went into hiding until his death on 5 November 1975. Trade unionists were also targeted by the repression in 1973 as Carlos Batch was assassinated on 21 August 1973. Enrique Damiano, of the Taxis Trade Union of Cordoba, on 3 October, Juan Avila, also of Cordoba, the following day, Pablo Frieds, on 30 October in Buenos Aires, and Adrian. Sanchez, on 8 November 1973 in the province of Jujuy. Assassinations of trade unions, lawyers and so on continued and increased in 1974 and 1975 while the most combative trade unions were closed and their leaders arrested. In August 1974, Isabel Perón's government took away the rights of trade unionist representation of the Federación Gráfica Bonaerense, whose secretary-general Raimundo Ingaro was arrested in October 1974. During the same month of August 1974, the SMATA Cordoba Trade Union, in conflict with the company Ica Renault, was closed by the National Direction of Trade Unions and the majority of its leaders and activists arrested. Most of them, including its secretary-general René Salamanca, were assassinated during the 1976-1983 dictatorship. Atilio López, General Secretary of the CGT of Córdoba and former Vice Governor of the province, was assassinated in Buenos Aires on 16 September 1974. Peronist guerrillas, estimated on 300 to 400 active members at 1977 and 2000 at his peak in 1975, though almost half of them related to militia, committed a number of delicts in this period such as bombings at Goodyear and Firestone distributors, Riker and Eli Pharmaceutical Laboratories, Xerox Corporation, and Pepsi-Cola bottling companies. Director General of the Fiat Concord Company in Argentina was kidnapped by ERP guerrillas in Buenos Aires on 21 March 1972 and found murdered on 10 April. On 73 feet a Ford Motor Company executive was killed in a kidnapping attempt, a Peugeot representative was kidnapped and later released for a reported $200,000, and FAP guerrillas killed John Swint, the American general manager of a Ford Motor Company. On December, the director of Peugeot in Argentina was kidnapped. On 1974, FAP guerrillas killed Ricardo Goya, the labor relations manager of the IKA Renault Motor Company in Cordoba. On 1975, Rodolfo Sarnier, manager of an auto parts factory and a production manager of Mercedes Benz, were kidnapped by Montaneros, and an executive of the U.S. Chrysler Corporation and a manager of the Renault plant in Cordoba were killed. On 1976, Enrique Arosa Garay of German-owned Borgward Automobile Factory and a Chrysler executive were killed. In all, 83 servicemen and policemen were killed in left-wing guerrilla incidents. Annihilation decrees In 1975, the Guevarist People's Revolutionary Army ERP, led by Roberto Santucho and inspired by Che Guevara's Foco theory, began a small rural insurgency in the province of Tucumán, with a campaign of no more than 100 men and women, which the Argentine army defeated. Italo Luder, president of the National Assembly who acted as interim president substituting himself to Isabel Perón who was ill for a short period, signed in February 1975 the secret presidential decree 261, which ordered the army to illegally neutralize and or annihilate the insurgency in Tucumán, the smallest province of Argentina. Operativo Independencia granted power to the armed forces to execute all military operations necessary for the effects of neutralizing or annihilating the action of subversive elements acting in the province of Tucumán. Extreme right-wing death squads used their hunt for far-left guerrillas as a pretext to exterminate any and all ideological opponents on the left and as a cover for common crimes. In July, there was a general strike. The government, presided temporarily by Italo Luder from the Peronist Party, issued three decrees, 2770, 2771 and 2772, that created a defense council headed by the president and including his ministers and the chiefs of the armed forces. It was given the command of the national and provincial police and correctional facilities and its mission was to annihilate subversive elements throughout the country. Topic. March 1975 raid in Santa Fe 
Isabel Perrin's government ordered a raid on 20 March 1975, which involved 4,000 military and police officers, in Villa Constitución, Santa Fe in response to various trade unionist conflicts. Many citizens and 150 activists and trade unionists leaders were arrested while the Union Abrera Metallurgica's subsidiary in Villa Constitución was closed down with the agreement of the trade union's national direction, headed by Lorenzo Miguel. Repression affected trade unionists of large firms such as Ford, Fiat, Renault, Mercedes-Benz, Peugeot and Chrysler and was sometimes carried on with support from the firm's executives and from the trade unionist bureaucracies. Military's rise to power The sentence of the trials to the junta states the subversives had not taken control of any part of the national territory, they had not obtained recognition of interior or anterior belligerency, they were not massively supported by any foreign power, and they lacked the population support." However, the supposed threat was used for the coup. In 1975, President Isabel Perón, under pressure from the military establishment, appointed Jorge Rafael Videla commander-in-chief of the Argentine army. As many people as necessary must die in Argentina so that the country will again be secure." Falsely declared Videla in 1975 in support of the death squads. He was one of the military heads of the coup that overthrew Isabel Perón on 24 March 1976. In her place, a military junta was installed, which was headed by Admiral Emilio Eduardo Massara, who stepped out in September 1978, General Orlando Agosti and Videla himself. The junta, which dubbed itself National Reorganization Process, systematized the repression, in particular through the way of forced disappearances, desaparecidos, which made it very difficult as in Augusto Pinochet's Chile to file legal suits as the bodies were never found. This generalization of state terror tactics has been explained in part by the information received by the Argentine militaries in the infamous School of Americas and also by French instructors from the secret services, who taught them counter-insurgency tactics first experimented during the Algerian War 1954 to 1962 by 1976 operation condor which had already centralized information from south american intelligence agencies for years was at its height chilean exiles in argentina were threatened again and had to seek refuge in a third country Chilean General Carlos Prats had already been assassinated by the Chilean Dina in Buenos Aires in 1974, with the help of former Dina agents Michael Townley and Enrique Aranchibia. Cuban diplomats were also assassinated in Buenos Aires in the infamous Automotors Orleti Torture Center, one of the 300 clandestine prisons of the dictatorship, managed by the Grupo de Torreas 18, headed by Annibal Gordon, previously convicted for armed robbery and answered directly to the general commandant of the side, Otto Palladino. Automotors Orleti was the main base of foreign intelligence services involved in Operation Condor. One of the survivors, José Luis Bertazzo, who was detained for two months there, identified Chileans, Uruguayans, Paraguayans and Bolivians among the prisoners. These captives were interrogated by agents from their own countries. According to John Dinges's Los Años del Condor, Chilean mere prisoners in Orleti Center told José Luis Bertazzo that they had seen two Cuban diplomats, Jesús Cejas Arias and Crescencio Galanega, tortured by Gordon's group and interrogated by a man who came one day from Miami to interrogate them. The two Cuban diplomats, charged with the protection of the Cuban ambassador to Argentina Emilio Aragonés, had been kidnapped on 9 August 1976 by 40 armed side agents who blocked off all sides of the street with their Ford Falcons, the cars used by the security forces during the dictatorship. According to John Dinges, the FBI as well as the CIA were informed of their abduction. In his book, Dinges published a cable sent by Robert Scherer, an FBI agent in Buenos Aires on the 22nd of September 1976, where he mentions in passing that Michael Townley, later convicted of the assassination on 21 September 1976 of former Chilean minister Orlando Letelier in Washington, D.C., had also taken part to the interrogation of the two Cubans. Former head of the DINA confirmed to Argentine federal judge Maria Servini de Cubria on the 22nd of December 1999 in Santiago de Chile the presence of Townley and Cuban Guillermo Novo Sample in the Orleti Center. The two men traveled from Chile to Argentina on the 11th of August 1976 and 
cooperated in the torture and assassination of the two Cuban diplomats. According to the Terror Archives, discovered in Paraguay in 1992, 50,000 persons were murdered in the frame of Condor, 9,000 to 30,000 disappeared and 400,000 incarcerated. Topic: <laughs> Neoliberal policies of the juntas. During this period of neoliberal policies the level of the Argentine debt exploded, the economic policy of Martínez de Haas, Minister of Economy of the Dictatorship, applied from April 2, 1976, marks the beginning of a process of destruction of the productive apparatus of the Argentina. In Your Money or Your Life, historian and political scientist Eric Toussaint writes, most of the loans granted to the Argentine dictatorship came from the private banks of the U.S. It should be noted the complete agreement of the authorities of the United States either the Federal Reserve or the American administration, with this policy of indebtedness. To obtain loans from private banks, the government demanded that Argentine companies borrow from international private banks. The public companies thus became the fundamental lever for the denationalization of the state, and the loss of national sovereignty. The main Argentine public oil company, YPF Yasimientos Petrolíferos Fiscales, was forced to borrow abroad despite the fact that it had sufficient resources for its own development. At the time of the military coup of 24 March 1976, YPF's external debt was $372 million. Seven years later at the end of the dictatorship, this debt reached $6,000 million. The indebtedness had multiplied by 16 in seven years, because of the illegal character of the economic policies of Latin American dictatorship with banks as the International Monetary Fund, a committee for the abolition of illegitimate debt was formed. <laughs> Civil complices There were also some companies complicit in crimes against humanity. There has been participation of senior executives of Ford, Mercedes-Benz, Asindar, Dalmine Sidurka, Ingenio Ledesma, and Astarsa Victoria Baswaldo, from Columbia University, investigated the complicity between large companies and armed forces. She found six companies in which dozens of union representatives were kidnapped and tortured, often detained inside the companies and transferred to clandestine detention centers CDC in vehicles provided by the companies. In the case of Dalmin Sidurka, a CDC had been installed next to the factory, to which it communicated through a door. In the case of Asindar already during the Peronist government of Maria Estela Martinez de Peron in 1975, a detention center and interrogation by the federal police was installed inside the company. Judge Alicia Vence was in charge of the investigation of acts of state terrorism committed in facilities and with the participation of authorities of the companies Ford and Mercedes Benz, the latter led then by the race driver Juan Manuel Fangio, involved in the acts by the witnesses. In 2015, the investigation was carried out to carry out the oral trial against the accused. José Alfredo Martínez de Haas, president of the metallurgical company Asindar, who was Minister of Economy between 1976 and 1980, was criminally prosecuted in the case of the kidnapping of the businessmen Federico and Miguel Gutheim, owners of SADECO Cotton Company. The direct participation of Catholic religious in the commission of crimes against humanity is also proven. Christian von Wernich is a paradigmatic case. He is a Catholic priest, who served as a chaplain to the police of the province of Buenos Aires and used to visit clandestine detention centers, and was sentenced to life imprisonment in 2007 for kidnappings, torture, and homicides that were considered crimes against humanity. <laughs> False flag actions by site agents During a 1981 interview whose contents were revealed by documents declassified by the CIA in 2000, former DINA agent Michael Townley explained that Ignacio Novo Sampal, member of CORU anti-Castro organization, had agreed to commit the Cuban nationalist movement in the kidnapping in Buenos Aires of a president of a Dutch bank. The abduction, organized by civilian site agents, the Argentine intelligence agency, was to obtain a ransom. Townley said that Novo Sampal had provided $6,000 from the Cuban nationalist movement, forwarded to the civilian site agents to pay for the preparation expenses of the kidnapping. 
After returning to the United States, Novo Sampal sent Townley a stock of paper, used to print pamphlets in the name of Grupo Rojo Red Group, an imaginary Argentine Marxist terrorist organization, which was to claim credit for the abduction of the Dutch banker. Townley declared that the pamphlets were distributed in Mendoza and Córdoba in relation with false flag bombings perpetrated by side agents, which had as aim to accredit the existence of the fake Grupo Rojo. However, the side agents procrastinated too much and the kidnapping finally was not carried out. <laughs> Human rights violations from 1976 to 1983 The exact chronology of the repression occurring before the Operation Condors beginning in March 1976 is still debated, but some sectors claim the long political conflict started in 1969 as individual cases of state-sponsored terrorism against Peronism and the left can be traced back to the bombing of Plaza de Mayo and Revolución Libertadora in 1955. The Trelu massacre of 1972, the actions of the Argentine Anti-Communist Alliance since 1973 and Isabel Martínez de Perón's annihilation decrees against left-wing guerrillas during Operativo Independencia Operation Independence in 1975 have also been suggested as dates for the beginning of the Dirty War. The target of the junta was anyone believed to be associated with activist groups, including trade union members, students including underage students, like in Night of the Pencils, an operation directed by Ramon Camps, general and head of the Buenos Aires Provincial Police from April 1976 to December 1977, people who had uncovered evidence of government corruption and people thought to hold left-wing views including French nuns Leonie Duquette and Alice Domon, kidnapped by Alfredo Astiz. Ramon Camps told Claren in 1984 that he had used torture as a method of interrogation and orchestrated 5,000 forced disappearances and justified the appropriation of newborns from their imprisoned mothers, "...because subversive parents will raise subversive children." These individuals who suddenly vanished are called Los Desaparecidos, meaning, "...the missing ones," or "...disappeared." In December 1976, 22 captured Montaneros responsible for the death of General Caceres Manier and the attack on the Argentine Army 29th Mountain Infantry Regiment were tortured and executed during the massacre of Margarita Bellin in the military Chaco province, for which Videla would be found guilty of homicide during the 1985 trial of the Juntas as well as Cristino Nicolades, Junta leader Leopoldo Galtieri and Santa Fe Provincial Police Chief Wenceslao Senequel. The same year, 50 anonymous persons were illegally executed by a firing squad in Córdoba. Victims' relatives uncovered evidence that some children taken from their mothers soon after birth were being raised as the adopted children of military men as in the case of Silvia Quintela, a member of the Montaneros guerrillas movement. For three decades, the mothers and grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo, a group founded in 1977, has demanded the return of these kidnapped children, estimated to number as many as 500. In a declassified memorandum from the U.S. State Department dated May 1978, it is asserted that, If there has been a net reduction in reports of torture, this is not because torture has been forsworn but derives from fewer operations because the number of terrorists and subversives has diminished and presents that case that disappearances include not only suspected terrorists but also encompass a broader range of people, for example, labor leaders, workers, clergymen, human rights advocates, scientists, doctors, and political party leaders. The report describes the torture methods used to intimidate and extract information, including electric shocks, prolonged immersion in water, cigarette burns, sexual abuse, rape, the removal of teeth and fingernails, burning with boiling water, oil and acid, and castration. In late 1979, Amnesty International accused the Videla military government of being responsible for the disappearance of 15,000 to 20,000 Argentine citizens since the 1976 coup. The Registro Unificado de Victimas del Terrorismo de Estado got a record of 662 people listed disappeared under the presidency of Isabel Martínez de Perón and other 6,348 disappeared during the military dictatorship. In 1980, Adolfo Pérez Esquivel, a Catholic human rights activist who had organized the Servicio de Paz y Justicia Peace and, Justice Service and suffered torture while held without trial for 14 months in a Buenos Aires concentration camp, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts in the defense of human rights. 
Declassified documents of the Chilean secret police cite an official estimate by the Batallón de Inteligencia 601 of 22,000 killed or disappeared between 1975 and mid-1978. During this period, it was later revealed that at least 12,000 disappeared were detainees held by PEN Poder Ejecutivo Nacional, anglicized as National Executive Power and kept in clandestine detention camps throughout Argentina before eventually being freed under diplomatic pressure. In 2003, the National Commission on the Disappearance of Persons recorded the forced disappearance of 8,961 persons from 1976 to 1983, although it noted that the actual number is higher. The members of Junta Militar currently in prison convicted of crimes against humanity refused to give to the Argentine justice the lists of names and numbers of kidnapped, tortured, murdered or disappeared people, so the exact number of victims remains uncertain. Under Carlos Menem government Congress passed legislation to provide compensation to victims' families. Some 11,000 Argentines as the next of kin have applied to the relevant authorities and received up to $200,000 each as monetary compensation for the loss of loved ones during the military dictatorship while others as mothers of the Plaza de Mayo refused to receive any money from a government that they considered to be following the same neoliberal policies dictated by Operation Condor. Topic. Disappeared held under pen. By the time of the coup on 24 March 1976, the number of disappeared held under Poder Ejecutivo Nacional Pen stood at least 5,182. Some 18,000 disappeared in the form of Pen detainees were imprisoned in Argentina by the end of 1977 and it is estimated that some 3,000 deaths occurred in the Navy Engineering School alone. These disappeared were held incommunicado and reportedly tortured. Some, like Senator Ippolito Solari Irigoyen and socialist leader Professor Alfredo Bravo, were detenidos desaparecidos by refusing to acknowledge the existence of what was later established to be at least 340 concentration camps throughout the country they also denied the existence of their occupants. The total number of people who were detained for long periods was 8,625. Among them was future President Carlos Menem, who between 1976 and 1981 had been a political prisoner. Some 8,600 pen disappeared were eventually released under international pressure. Of these, 4,029 were held in illegal detention centers for less than a year, 2,296 for one to three years, 1,172 for three to five years, 668 for five to seven years and 431 for seven to nine years. Of these, 157 were murdered after being released from detention. In one Frank memo, written in 1977, an official at the Foreign Ministry issued the following warning. Our situation presents certain aspects which are without doubt difficult to defend if they are analyzed from the point of view of international law. These are, the delays incurred before foreign consuls can visit detainees of foreign nationality, contravening Article 34 of the Convention of Vienna, the fact that those detained under executive power pen, are denied the right to legal advice or defense, the complete lack of information of persons detained under pen, the fact that pen detainees are not processed for long periods of time, the fact that there are no charges against detainees. The kidnapping and disappearance of people. Topic. Children of the disappeared At the time when the CONADEP report was prepared, the Asociación Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo Grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo or Abuelas, had records of 172 children who disappeared together with their parents or were born at the numerous concentration camps and had not been returned to their families. The grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo now believe up to 500 grandchildren were stolen and 102 are believed to have been located. On 13 April 2000, the grandmothers received a tip-off that the birth certificate of Rosa Roisenblatt's infant grandson, born in detention, had been falsified and the child given to an Air Force civil agent and his wife. Following the anonymous phone call, he was located and agreed to a DNA blood test, confirming his true identity. Rodolfo Fernando, grandson of Roisenblatt, is the first known newborn of missing children returned to his family through the work of the grandmothers. 
On 6 October 1978, Roizenblatt's daughter, 25-year-old Patricia Julia Roizenblatt de Perez, who was active in the Montaneros, was kidnapped along with her husband, 24-year-old José Martínez Pérez Rojo. The case of Maria Eugenia Sampalo, born sometime in 1978, also received considerable attention as Sampalo sued the couple who adopted her illegally as a baby after her parents disappeared, both Montaneros. Her grandmother spent 24 years looking for her. The case was filed in 2001 after DNA tests indicated that Osvaldo Rivas and Maria Cristina Gomez were not her biological parents. Along with Army Captain Enrique Berthier, who furnished the couple with the baby, they were sentenced respectively to 8, 7 and 10 years in prison for kidnapping. <laughs> <laughs> Mothers of the Plaza de Mayo The Mothers of the Plaza de Mayo is the best-known Argentine human rights organization. For over 30 years, the mothers have campaigned to find out about the fate of their lost relatives. The mothers first held their vigil at Plaza de Mayo in 1977, where they continue to gather there every Thursday afternoon. An article of the Madres of the Plaza de Mayo monthly publication caused quite a stir in the mid-1980s, when the human rights group familiars were quoted as saying. Familiars assumes the causes of their children's fight as their own, vindicates all the disappeared as fighters of the people, and when occurs the defeat of imperialism and the sovereignty of the people, we will have achieved our objectives. In 1986, the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo split into two groups, Las Madres de Plaza de Mayo, Linea Fundadora founding line, remains focused in recovering the remains of the missing and bringing former police and military commanders to justice. On the other hand, the Asociación de Madres de Plaza de Mayo Mothers of the Plaza de Mayo Association is opposed to the search for an identification of the missing and have also rejected monetary compensation. In April 2004, the former head of the Mothers of Plaza Hebe de Bonafini declared her admiration for her missing children Jorge Omar and Raúl Alfredo for taking up arms as left-wing guerrillas. Coordination on international criminal operations In 1980, the Argentine military helped Nazi war criminal Klaus Barbie, Stefano della Chiai and major drug lords mount the bloody cocaine coup of Luis Garcia Meza Tejada in neighboring Bolivia. They hired 70 foreign agents for this task, which was managed in particular by the 601st Intelligence Battalion headed by General Guillermo Suarez Mason. After having been trained by the French military, in the frame of Operation Charlie the Argentine armed forces would train their counterparts in Nicaragua, but also El Salvador, Honduras and Guatemala. From 1977 to 1984, after the Falklands War the Argentine armed forces exported counter-insurgency tactics, including the systemic use of torture, death squads and disappearances. Special force units, such as Batallón de Inteligencia 601, headed in 1979 by Colonel Jorge Alberto Muzio, trained the Nicaraguan Contras in the 1980s, in particular in Lepiteric Base. Following the release of classified documents and an interview with Duane Claridge, former CIA responsible for operations with the Contras, the Claren showed that with the election of President Jimmy Carter in 1977 the CIA was blocked from engaging in the special warfare it had previously been engaged in. In conformity with the national security doctrine, the Argentine military supported U.S. goals in Latin America while they pressured the United States to be more active in counter-revolutionary activities. In 1981, following the election of Ronald Reagan the CIA took over training of the Contras from Batallón 601. Many Chilean and Uruguayan exiles in Argentina were murdered by Argentine security forces including high-profile figures such as General Carlos Prats in Buenos Aires in 1974, Héctor Gutiérrez Ruiz and Zelmer Michelini in Buenos Aires in 1976. Others, such as Wilson Ferreira Aldenet escaped death. Topic. United States involvement with the junta Although at least six U.S. citizens had been «disappeared» by the Argentine military by 1976, high-ranking State Department officials including then-Secretary of State Henry Kissinger had secretly backed up Argentina's new military rulers. During his years as U.S. Secretary of State, Kissinger had congratulated Argentina's military junta for combating the left, stating that in his opinion, 
the government of Argentina had done an outstanding job in wiping out terrorist forces. The importance of his role was not known about until The Nation published in October 1987 an expose written by Martin Edwin Anderson, a Washington Post and Newsweek special correspondent. Kissinger had secretly given the junta a green light for their state terrorist policies, being the U.S. Army School of the Americas (SOA), founded in 1946, assigned the specific goal of teaching anti-communist counterinsurgency training. The place where several Latin American dictators, generations of their military were educated in state terrorism tactics, including the uses of torture in its curriculum. In 2000-2001, the institute was renamed to WHINSEC. According to a Command and General Foundation news issue, the current curriculum at WHINSEC is compatible with curriculum taught at U.S. military academies. WHINSEC faculty members travel to Fort Leavenworth in Kansas throughout the year in order to remain up to date on curriculum changes. However, the school remains controversial due to its influence over affairs in Latin America and its education of Latin American state actors on crimes against humanity within the military and law enforcement. In Buenos Aires, Robert C. Hill, a five time conservative Republican ambassadorial appointee, worked behind the scenes to keep the Argentina military junta from engaging in massive human rights violations. Upon finding out that Kissinger had given the Argentine generals a green light, for the state terrorism of the junta in June 1976 while at an organization of American states meeting in Santiago at the Hotel Carrera, later made famous as the Hotel Cabrera in the film Missing, Hill quietly scrambled to try to roll back the Kissinger decision. Hill did this although Kissinger aides told him that if he continued, Kissinger would likely have him fired. During that meeting with Argentine Foreign Minister César Augusto Gazzetti, Kissinger assured him that the United States was an ally. In October 1987, The Nation noted, Hill was shaken, he became very disturbed, by the case of the son of a 30-year embassy employee, a student who was arrested, never to be seen again, recalled former New York Times reporter Juan de Onis. Hill took a personal interest, he went to the interior minister, an army general with whom he had worked on drug cases, saying, hey, what about this? We're interested in this case, he buttonholed Foreign Minister César Gazzetti and, finally, President Jorge R. Videla himself. All he got was stonewalling, he got nowhere, de Onis said. His last year was marked by increasing disillusionment and dismay, and he backed his staff on human rights right to the hilt. It sickened me said Patricia Durian, the Mississippi civil rights crusader who became President Jimmy Carter's State Department point person on human rights, after Hill reported to her Kissinger's real role, that with an imperial wave of his hand, an American could sentence people to death on the basis of a cheap whim. As time went on I saw Kissinger's footprints in a lot of countries. It was the repression of a democratic ideal. In 1978, former Secretary Kissinger was fated by the Dirty War. Generals is a much touted guest of honor at the World Cup soccer matches held in Argentina. In a letter to the Nation editor Victor Navosky, protesting publication of the 1987 article, Kissinger claimed, At any rate, the notion of Hill as a passionate human rights advocate is news to all his former associates. Ironically, Kissinger's posthumous lampooning of Hill who had died in 1978 as human rights advocate was later shown to be false by none other than once and future Kissinger aide Henry Schlaudman, later ambassador to Buenos Aires, who told William E. Knight, an oral historian working for the Association for Diplomatic Studies and Training ADST Foreign Affairs Oral History Project, it really came to a head when I was assistant secretary, or it began to come to a head, in the case of Argentina where the dirty war was in full flower. Bob Hill, who was ambassador then in Buenos Aires, a very conservative Republican politician, by no means liberal or anything of the kind, began to report quite effectively about what was going on, this slaughter of innocent civilians. He, at one time in fact, sent me a back-channel telegram saying that the foreign minister, who had just come for a visit to Washington and had returned to Buenos Aires, had gloated to him that Kissinger had said nothing to him about human rights. I don't know, I wasn't present at the interview. 
State Department documents obtained in 2003 during the George W. Bush administration by the National Security Archive under the Freedom of Information Act show that in October 1976 Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and high-ranking U.S. officials gave their full support to the Argentine military junta and urged them to hurry up and finish their actions before the Congress cut military aid. On 5 October 1976, Kissinger met with Argentina's foreign minister and stated, Look, our basic attitude is that we would like you to succeed. I have an old-fashioned view that friends ought to be supported. What is not understood in the United States is that you have a civil war. We read about human rights problems but not the context. The quicker you succeed the better. The human rights problem is a growing one. Your ambassador can apprise you. We want a stable situation. We won't cause you unnecessary difficulties. If you can finish before Congress gets back, the better. Whatever freedoms you could restore would help. The United States was also a key provider of economic and military assistance to the Videla regime during the earliest and most intense phase of the repression. In early April 1976, the Congress approved a request by the Ford administration, written and supported by Henry Kissinger, to grant $50 million in security assistance to the junta. At the end of 1976, Congress granted an additional $30 million in military aid and recommendations by the Ford administration to increase military aid to $63,500,000 the following year were also considered by Congress. U.S. assistance, training and military sales to the Videla regime continued under the successive Carter administration up until at least 30 September 1978 when military aid was officially called to a stop within Section 502B of the Foreign Assistance Act. In 1977 and 1978, the United States sold more than $120 million in military spare parts to Argentina and in 1977 the Department of Defense was granted $700,000 to train 217 Argentine military officers. By the time the International Military Education and Training program was suspended to Argentina in 1978, total U.S. training costs for Argentine military personnel since 1976 totaled $1,115,000. The Reagan administration, whose first term began in 1981, asserted that the previous Carter administration had weakened U.S. diplomatic relationships with Cold War allies in Argentina and reversed the previous administration's official condemnation of the junta's human rights practices. The re-establishment of diplomatic ties allowed for CIA collaboration with the Argentine Intelligence Service in training and arming the Nicaraguan Contras against the Sandinista government. The 601 Intelligence Battalion, for example, trained Contras at Lepiteric Base in Honduras. <inaudible> <inaudible> French connection Investigating French military influence in Argentina, French journalist Marie-Monique Robin found in 2003 the original document proving that a 1959 agreement between Paris and Buenos Aires initiated a permanent French military mission in Argentina and reported on it she found the document in the archives of the Quai d'Orsay, the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The mission was formed of veterans who had fought in the Algerian War and it was assigned to the offices of the Chief of Staff of the Argentine Armed Forces. It was continued until 1981, date of the election of socialist François Mitterrand, after release of her documentary film Escadrons de la Mort, L'École Française in 2003 which explored the French connection with South American nations, Robin said in an interview with La Humanité newspaper, French have systematized a military technique in urban environment which would be copied and pasted to Latin American dictatorship. She noted that the French military had systematized the methods they used to suppress the insurgency during the 1957 Battle of Algiers and exported them to the war school in Buenos Aires. Roger Trinquire's famous book on counter-insurgency had a very strong influence in South America. In addition, Robin said she was shocked to learn that the DST French intelligence agency gave Dina the names of refugees who returned to Chile Operation Retorna from France during their counter-insurgency. All of these Chileans have been killed. Of course, this puts in cause sick, this makes responsible the French government, and Giscard d'Estaing, then President of the Republic. I was very shocked by the duplicity of the French diplomatic position which, on one hand, received with open arms the political refugees, and, on the other hand, collaborated with the dictatorship. 
On 10 September 2003, Green members of Parliament Noel Mamir, Martin Billard and Yves Cachet filed a request to form a parliamentary commission to examine the "...role of France in the support of military regimes in Latin America from 1973 to 1984." Before the Foreign Affairs Commission of the National Assembly, presided by Édouard Balladur Ump. Apart from Le Monde, French newspapers did not report this request. Ump deputy Roland Blum, in charge of the commission, refused to let Marie-Monique Robin testify on this topic. The commission in December 2003 published a 12-page report claiming that the French had never signed a military agreement with Argentina. When Minister of Foreign Affairs Dominique de Villepin traveled to Chile in February 2003, he claimed that no cooperation between France and the military regimes had occurred. People in Argentina were outraged when they saw the 2003 film, which included three generals defending their actions during the Dirty War. Due to public pressure, President Nestor Kirchner ordered the military to bring charges against the three for justifying the crimes of the dictatorship. They were Albano Hargangay, Reynaldo Bignoni, and Ramon Ganero Diaz Bison. The next year, Robin published her book under the same title Escadrons de la Mort, L'Ecole Francaise, Death Squads, The French School, 2004, revealing more material. She showed how Valéry Giscard d'Estaing's government secretly collaborated with Videla's junta in Argentina and with Augusto Pinochet's regime in Chile. Alcides López Aufranc was among the first Argentine officers to go in 1957 to Paris to study for two years at the École de Guerre Military School, two years before the Cuban Revolution and when no Argentine guerrillas existed. In practice, declared Robin to Pagina, 12, the arrival of the French in Argentina led to a massive extension of intelligence services and of the use of torture as the primary weapon of the anti-subversive war in the concept of modern warfare. The annihilation decrees signed by Isabel Perón had been inspired by French texts. During the Battle of Algiers, the police forces were put under the authority of the army, 30,000 persons were disappeared in Algeria. Reynaldo Bignoni, named president of the Argentine Junta in July 1982, said in Robin's film, The March 1976 order of battle is a copy of the Algerian battle. The same statements were made by generals Albano Harguindegui, Videla's interior minister, and Diaz Bison, former minister of planification and ideologue of the junta. The French military would transmit to their Argentine counterparts the notion of an internal enemy and the use of torture, death squads and quadrillages grids. Marie-Monique Robin also demonstrated that since the 1930s, there had been ties between the French far-right and Argentina, in particular through the Catholic fundamentalist organization Cité Catholique, created by Jean Ousset, a former secretary of Charles Maurras, the founder of the Royalist Action Française movement. La Cité edited a review, Le Verbe, which influenced militaries during the Algerian War, notably by justifying the use of torture. At the end of the 1950s, the Cité Catholique founded groups in Argentina and organized cells in the army. It greatly expanded during the government of General Juan Carlos Ongania, in particular in 1969. The key figure of the Cité Catholique in Argentina was priest Georges Grasset, who became Videla's personal confessor. He had been the spiritual guide of the organization Armée Secrète OS, the pro-French Algeria terrorist movement founded in Franquist Spain. Robin believes that this Catholic fundamentalist current in the Argentine army contributed to the importance and length of the French-Argentine cooperation. In Buenos Aires, Georges Grasset maintained links with Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, founder of Society of St. Pius X in 1970, who was excommunicated in 1988. The Society of Pius X has four monasteries in Argentina, the largest one in La Regia. A French priest from there said to Marie-Monique Robin, to save the soul of a communist priest, one must kill him." Luis Roldan, former secretary of cult under Carlos Menem, president of Argentina from 1989 to 1999, was presented by Dominique Lagno, the priest in charge of the monastery, to Robin as, Mr. Cité Catholique in Argentina. Bruno Genta and Juan Carlos Goyanesh represent this ideology. Antonio Caggiano, Archbishop of Buenos Aires from 1959 to 1975, wrote a prologue to Jean Ousset's 1961 Spanish version of La Marxism Leninisme. Caggiano said that, Marxism is the negation of Christ and his Church, and referred to a Marxist conspiracy to take over the world, for which it was necessary to 
prepare for the decisive battle. Together with President Arturo Frondizi, Radical Civic Union (UCR), Caggiano inaugurated the first course on counter-revolutionary warfare in the Higher Military College. Frondizi was eventually overthrown for being tolerant of communism. By 1963, cadets at the Navy Mechanics School started receiving counter-insurgency classes. They were shown the film The Battle of Algiers, which showed the methods used by the French Army in Algeria. Caggiano, the military chaplain at the time, introduced the film and added a religiously oriented commentary to it. On 2 July 1966, four days after President Arturo Umberto Illia was removed from office and replaced by the dictator Juan Carlos Ongania, Caggiano declared, We are at a sort of dawn, in which, thanks to God, we all sense that the country is again headed for greatness. Argentine Admiral Luis Maria Mendia, who had started the practice of death flights, testified in January 2007 before Argentine judges, that a French intelligence agent, Bertrand de Perceval, had participated in the abduction of the two French nuns, Leonie Duquette and Alice Domont. Perceval, who lives today in Thailand, denied any links with the abduction. He has admitted being a former member of the OAS and having escaped from Algeria after the March 1962 Evian Accords put an end to the Algerian War 1954-1962. During the 2007 hearings, Luis Maria Mendia referred to material presented in Robin's documentary, titled The Death Squads, The French School 2003. He asked the Argentine court to call numerous French officials to testify to their actions, former French President, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, former French Premier Pierre Mesmer, former French Ambassador to Buenos Aires Françoise de la Gosse and all officials in place in the French Embassy in Buenos Aires between 1976 and 1983. Besides this, French connection, Maria Mendia also charged former head of state Isabel Perón and former ministers Carlos Rucauf and Antonio Cafiero, who had signed the anti-subversion decrees before Videla's 1976 coup. According to Graciela Dallo, a survivor of the ESMA interrogations, Mendia was trying to establish that these crimes were legitimate, as the 1987 Obediencia de Bita Act claimed them to be and further that the ESMA actions had been committed under Isabel Perrin's anti-subversion decrees, which would give them a formal appearance of legality, although torture is forbidden by the Argentine constitution. Alfredo Astiz also referred to the French connection when testifying in court. Topic. Truth Commission and decrees revoked The junta relinquished power in 1983. After democratic elections, President-elect Raúl Alfonsín created the National Commission on the Disappearance of Persons in December 1983, led by writer Ernesto Sabato, to collect evidence about the dirty war crimes. The gruesome details, including documentation of the disappearance of nearly 9,000 people, shocked the world. Jorge Rafael Videla, head of the junta, was among the generals convicted of human rights crimes, including forced disappearances, torture, murders and kidnappings. President Alfonsín ordered that the nine members of the military junta be judicially charged during the 1985 trial of the juntas. As of 2010, most of the military officials are in trial or jail. In 1985, Videla was sentenced to life imprisonment at the military prison of Magdalena. Several senior officers also received jail terms. In the prologue to the Nunca Mas report, Never Again, Ernesto Sabato wrote, From the moment of their abduction, the victims lost all rights. Deprived of all communication with the outside world, held in unknown places, subjected to barbaric tortures, kept ignorant of their immediate or ultimate fate, they risked being either thrown into a river or the sea, weighted down with blocks of cement, or burned to ashes. They were not mere objects, however, and still possessed all the human attributes, they could feel pain, could remember a mother, child or spouse, could feel infinite shame at being raped in public. Reacting to the human rights trials, hardliners in the Argentine army staged a series of uprisings against the Alfonsín government. They barricaded themselves in several military barracks demanding an end of the trials. During Holy Week Semana Santa of April 1987, Lieutenant Colonel Aldo Rico commander of the 18th Infantry Regiment in Misiones Province and several junior army officers, barricaded themselves in the Campo de Mayo army barracks. 
The military rebels, who were called the Carapintadas, called for an end to the trials and the resignation of Army Chief of Staff General Hector Rios Aranyu. Rico believed that the Alfonsin government would be unwilling or unable to put down the uprising. He was correct as the 2nd Army Corps commander's orders to surround the barracks were ignored by his subordinates. Alfonsin called on the people to come to the Plaza de Mayo to defend democracy and hundreds of thousands responded. After a helicopter visit by Alfonsin to Campo de Mayo, the rebels finally surrendered. There were denials of a deal, but several generals were forced into early retirement and General José Dante Caridi was soon replaced Aranu as commander of the army. In January 1988, a second military rebellion took place when Rico refused to accept the detention orders issued by a military court for having led the previous uprising. This time he set up base in the 4th Infantry Regiment in Monte Caseros and repudiated Caridi's calls to hand himself in. Rico again demanded an end to the human rights trials saying the promises of Alfonsin to the rebels had not been fulfilled. Caridi ordered several army units to suppress the rebellion. Their advance to the Monte Caseros barracks was slowed down by the rains and the news that rebel soldiers had laid mines that had wounded three loyal officers. Nevertheless, Rico's forces were defeated after a three-hour battle. They surrendered on 17 January 1988 and 300 rebels were arrested, and sentenced to jail. A third uprising took place in December 1988. This time the uprising was led by Lt. Col. Muhammad Ali Sineldin and was supported by 1,000 rebel troops. This uprising proved successful. Several of the demands of Sineldin and his followers were met. Caridi was forced into retirement and replaced by General Francisco Gassino, who had served in the Falklands – Malvinas War and was held in high esteem by the Carapintadas. On 5 October 1989, as part of a sweeping reform the newly elected President Carlos Menem pardoned those convicted in the human right trials and the rebel leaders imprisoned for taking part in the military uprisings. These amnesty laws were long unpopular first with surviving victims of the Dirty War and their families, later on between most of the population. In 2005, under Nestor Kirchner presidency, the trials were opened again. Most of the junta's members are currently in prison by charges of crimes against humanity and genocide. Foreign governments whose citizens were victims of the Dirty War which included citizens of Czechoslovakia, Italy, Sweden, Finland, Germany, the United States, the United Kingdom, Paraguay, Bolivia, Spain, Chile, Uruguay, Peru and several other nations are pressing individual cases against the former military regime. France has sought the extradition of Captain Alfredo Astiz for the kidnapping and murder of its nationals, among them nuns Leonie Duquette and Alice Doman. Topic. Continuing controversies On 23 January 1989, an armed group of around 40 guerrillas, a faction of the Movimiento Todos por la Patria MTP or All for the Fatherland movement, attacked the La Tablada Army barracks on the outskirts of Buenos Aires to prevent a military coup. The attack resulted in 28 of the guerrillas killed, 5 disappeared, and 13 imprisoned. 11 police and military died, and 53 were wounded in the fighting. The guerrillas claimed to have acted to prevent a military coup. Among the dead at La Tablada was Jorge Baños, a human rights lawyer who had joined the guerrillas. The MTP attack to prevent a military coup has been suspected to be led by infiltrated intelligence military service. In 2002, Maxima, daughter of Jorge Zorreguieta, a civilian cabinet minister of Argentina during the early phase of the dictatorship, married Willem Alexander, Crown Prince of the Netherlands. All of the Netherlands had wrestled in controversy over her suitability, but ultimately the marriage took place without the presence of her parents. Maxima thus became queen when her husband ascended to the throne in 2013. In August 2016, Argentine President Mauricio Macri was widely condemned by Human Rights Group for calling into question the number of 30,000 disappeared and for referring to the period as a dirty war. During the Argentine Bicentennial Independence Celebrations on 9 July 2016, former Colonel Carlos Carrizo Salvadors drew criticism from the left for leading the March of Malvinas War Veterans and Veterans of Operation Independence, the counterinsurgency campaign in northern Argentina. Carrizo Salvadors had been sentenced to life imprisonment in 2013 for his part as a paratrooper captain in the so-called Rosario Chapel Massacre in Catamarca Province, but was acquitted under the new government of Mauricio Macri. 
Topic: <laughs> Repeal of pardon laws and renewal of prosecutions. Under Nestor Kirchner's term as president in 2003, the Argentine Congress revoked the long-standing amnesty laws, also called the pardon laws. In 2005, the Argentine Supreme Court ruled these laws were unconstitutional. The government reopened prosecution of war crimes. From then through October 2011, 259 persons were convicted for crimes against humanity and genocide and sentenced in Argentine courts, including Alfredo Astiz, a notorious torturer, that month. In 2006, the 24th of March was designated as a public holiday in Argentina, the Day of Remembrance for Truth and Justice. That year on the 30th anniversary of the coup, a huge crowd filled the streets to remember what happened during the military government and ensure it did not happen again. In 2006, the government began its first trials of military and security officers since the repeal of the pardon laws. Miguel Echecolitz, the police commissioner of the province of Buenos Aires in the 1970s, faced trial on charges of illegal detention, torture and homicide. He was found guilty of six counts of murder, six counts of unlawful imprisonment and seven counts of torture and sentenced in September 2006 to life imprisonment. In February 2006, some former Ford Argentine workers sued the U.S.-based company, alleging that local managers worked with the security forces to detain union members on the premises and torture them. The civil suit against Ford Motor Company and Ford Argentina called for four former company executives and a retired military officer to be questioned. According to Pedro Norberto Troiani, one of the plaintiffs, 25 employees were detained in the plant, located 40 miles 60 kilometers from Buenos Aires. Allegations have surfaced since 1998 that Ford officials were involved in state repression, but the company has denied the claims. Army personnel were reported to have arrived at the plant on the day of the military coup on 24 March 1976 and disappearances. Immediately started, in 2007, President Christina Kirchner continued prosecution of military and security officers responsible for the disappearances. On 14 December 2007, some 200 men who were at military service during the dictatorship demanded an audience with the governor of Tucumán province, claiming they too were victims of the junta as they had no choice and suffered hunger, abandonment, physical and psychological injuries, demanding a military pension. In February 2010, a German court issued an international arrest warrant for former dictator Jorge Videla in connection with the death of 20-year-old Rolf Stauwiewicz in Argentina. He was a German citizen born in Argentina while his father was doing development work there. Rolf Stauwiewicz disappeared on 21 February 1978. In earlier cases, France, Italy and Spain had requested extradition of the Navy captain Alfredo Astiz for war crimes related to his work with ESMA, but were never successful. In 1977, General Albano Hargindegui, Interior Minister, admitted that 5,618 people disappeared in the form of pen detenidos desaparecidos were being held in detention camps throughout Argentina. According to a secret cable from DINA Chilean secret police in Buenos Aires, an estimate by the Argentine 601st Intelligence Battalion in mid-July 1978, which started counting victims in 1975, gave the figure of 22,000 persons. This document was first published by John Dinges in 2004. Topic. Participation of members of the Catholic Church On 15 April 2005, a human rights lawyer filed a criminal complaint against Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio now Pope Francis, accusing him of conspiring with the junta in 1976 to kidnap two Jesuit priests. So far, no hard evidence has been presented linking the cardinal to this crime. It is known that the cardinal headed the Society of Jesus of Argentina in 1976 and had asked the two priests to leave their pastoral work following conflict within the society over how to respond to the new military dictatorship, with some priests advocating a violent overthrow. The cardinal's spokesman flatly denied the allegations. A priest, Christian von Wernich, was chaplain of the Buenos Aires Province Police while it was under the command of General Ramon Camps during the dictatorship, with the rank of inspector. On 9 October 2007, he was found guilty of complicity in seven homicides, 42 kidnappings and 32 instances of torture and sentenced to life imprisonment. Some Catholic priests sympathized with and helped the Montaneros. 
Radical priests, including Father Alberto Carbone, who was eventually indicted in the murder of Aramburu, preached Marxism and presented the early church fathers as model revolutionaries in an attempt to legitimize the violence. A Catholic youth leader, Juan Ignacio Isla Casares, with the help of the Montaneros commander Eduardo Pereira Rossi nom de guerre, El Carlin, was the mastermind behind the ambush and killing of five policemen near San Isidro Cathedral on 26 October 1975. Mario Fermanich, who later became the leader of the Montaneros, was the ex president of the Catholic Action Youth Group and a former seminarian himself. The Montaneros had ties with the movement of priests for the Third World and a Jesuit priest, Carlos Mujica. <laughs> Art, entertainment, and media Topic. Books Dirty Secrets, Dirty War, The Exile of Editor Robert J. Cox, by David Cox 2008. The Ministry of Special Cases, novel by Nathan Englander 2007. La Historia Official English, The Official Story, Revisionist Critique by Nicolas Marquez 2006. Guerrillas and Generals, The Dirty War in Argentina, by Paul H. Lewis 2001. Sweet Argentina, English, Argentine Sweet. Translated by Donald A. Yates. Online, Words Without Borders, October 2010 Four short stories by Edgar Brow, 2000. God's Assassins, State Terrorism in Argentina in the 1970s by M. Patricia Marchik, 1999. A Lexicon of Terror, Argentina and the Legacies of Torture, by Marguerite Feitlowitz, 1999. Una sola muerte numerosa English, A Single, Numberless Death, by Nora Stregilovich The Flight, Confessions of an Argentine Dirty Warrior, by Horacio Verbitsky Argentina's Lost Patrol, Armed Struggle, 1969–1979, by Maria José Moyano Dossier Secreto, Argentina's Desaparecidos and the Myth of the Dirty War, by Martin Edwin Anderson Argentina's Dirty War, an Intellectual Biography, by Donald C. Hodges 1991. Behind the Disappearances, Argentina's Dirty War Against Human Rights and the United Nations, by Ian Guest 1990. The Little School, Tales of Disappearance and Survival in Argentina, by Alicia Partnoy 1989. Argentina, 1943-1987, The National Revolution and Resistance, by Donald C. Hodges 1988. Soldiers of Peron, Argentina's Montaneros, by Richard Gillespie 1982. Guerrilla Warfare in Argentina and Colombia, 1974–1982, by Bynum E. Weathers, Jr. 1982. Prisoner Without a Name, Cell Without a Number, by Jacobo Timerman 1981. Guerrilla Politics in Argentina, by Kenneth F. Johnson 1975. Topic films A Wall of Silence 1993, directed by Lita Standik Kadiva 2003, directed by Gaston Byraben. Movie related to the Stolen Babies case. Imagining Argentina 2003, directed by Christopher Hampton. Garage Olimpo 1999, directed by Marco Becchis. The Official Story 1985, directed by Luis Puenzo. Movie related to the Stolen Babies case. Kamchatka 2002, directed by Marcelo Pinero. Los Rubias 2003, directed by Albertina Carey. Burnt Oranges 2005, directed by Silvia Milagrino, wrote by Monica Flores Correa and edited by Sharon Karp. The Disappeared 2007, directed by Peter Sanders. The Death Squadron, by Marie-Monique Robin book and film. Our Disappeared 2008, directed by Juan Mandelbaum. Night of the Pencils, 1986, directed by Hector Oliveira. Cronica de una Fuga, 2006, directed by Israel Adrián Caetano. Movie related to the Mansion Sarah case. Hijos, Figli, Children, 2001, directed by Marco Becchis. The Secret in Their Eyes, 2009, directed by Juan José Campanella. Where is My Grandchild? A 2015 documentary by Retro Report about the grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo. 
Topic see also Armed Forces of the Argentine Republic Films depicting Latin American military dictatorship Hector German Osterheld, a famous politically engaged comic book artist who disappeared and presumed dead in 1977 during the Dirty War Maria Eugenia Sampaolo Operation Gladio topic References topic External links Proyecto Desaparecidos – Project Disappeared. Unearthing Mysteries of Argentina's Dirty War. Slideshow by CNN. War Diary of Brigadier General Akdel Vilas. How much did the U.S. know about the kidnapping, torture, and murder of over 20,000 people in Argentina? Now, President Obama has the chance to apologize for American complicity in the dirty war, by Martin Edwin Anderson, The Nation, March 4, 2016. Kissinger and the Dirty War by Martin Edwin Anderson, The Nation, October 31, 1987. 1984 Report of the National Commission on the Disappearance of Persons. Old Ideas in New Discourses. The War Against Terrorism. And Collective Memory in Uruguay and Argentina. Information from the Vanished Gallery. The Furthest Boundary Documentary 2004 on YouTube directed by Pablo Rato. A Serene Advocate for Chile's Disappeared by Alexei Berrianuevo, The New York Times, the 22nd of January 2010. Argentine torture survivor Patricia Izasa tells of her struggle to bring her torturers to justice. Kidnapped and raised by a military family, a recovered grandchild finds his way home. Video report by Democracy Now! Argentina holds death flights trial. Video report by Al Jazeera America. November 29, 2012. New memo, Kissinger gave the green light for Argentina's dirty war. Mother Jones. January 14, 2014.